Cast your mind back, if you can, to circa 2018. The new dawn, Ramaphoria. We got a new head of the National Prosecuting Authority, Shamila Batoy, and we were assured that a proper reckoning was coming for the architects and the foot soldiers of state capture. Six years later, it is fair to say that things have not gone entirely to plan, while our general crime stats just keep getting worse and worse. What is going on? Let's find out. Here to discuss crime and corruption are possibly the smoothest talker in South Africa, Deputy NPA Director Anton Duplessis. Watch out for Anton. He will charm the pants off you and you will forget all about the conviction rates. Watch. <laughs> National Chairperson of Action SA, Michael Beaumont. The DA's Rottweiler on Justice, Glennis Breitenbach. And a young man who deserves a shout out for being, in my opinion, the best spokesperson in government. It is not a crowded field. <laughs> Putting them, that is of course the Justice Department's Crispin Perry. Putting them through their paces are the man we all thank or blame for decriminalizing marijuana, that's Judge Dennis Davis, and the bravest journalist in South Africa, my colleague, Karen Dolly. Please welcome them on stage. Good morning, everyone. I'm Karen Dolly. I am a journalist at Daily Maverick. And to cut on time, I'm going to speak super fast. I've had enough coffee. Let's do this. So we've got Judge Dennis Davis. Judge for yourself with Dennis Davis. We've got Anton Duplessis, the Deputy National Director of Public Prosecutions. I practice that. And then we've got Glynis Breitenbach, the Advocate, dear Shadow Minister for Justice. We've got Kristen Peedy, Justice and Correctional Services spokesperson. And on our far side over there, we've got Michael Beaumont of Action Air. So, because we have a lot to discuss, we are sitting in the gangsterism capital of South Africa, the Western Cape. We've had 250 of 268 gang murders in the country happened here in three months. I'm going to launch right in there and go international, go global. Crispin, can you please tell us where the Guptas are right now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tell us, yeah. tell us. Um, so, so, from Cape Town to Dubai. Well, certainly the Guptas, as we understand it, are in Dubai. And one of the things we must understand about extradition is that it's a political and legal process. And in a place like Dubai, very little extraditions actually do happen successfully there. South Africa is not just one of the, one of the countries that are struggling. You speak of Denmark, you speak of the UK even, that have struggled to get people to come face charges in their jurisdiction. So we're not the first, but we are continuing and we will succeed. We so I just want to check, you did say they are in Dubai. As we understand. So people online in this audience, if you are traveling to or in Dubai, if you see them, please let Daily Maverick <laughs> know. My colleague Tori would appreciate it. Um, Judge Davis, would you like to take a next So let me, uh, Anton, I think I interviewed you last year here. Indeed. And that's one of the difficulties that interviewers have, interviewees, that interviewers like me remember what you said. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm interested because a year ago you told me, everybody, that wait and see, you'll see some big cases. And I want to put it to you, I'm still waiting. Here There's no, there, I mean, tell me one single major participant in state capture who is before the courts as we speak. <laughs> well, we, we, we started last year with a similar audience, at the, uh, similar applause. It's uh, having 2,000 people in the audience that want to rip your head off because <laughs> you haven't proceeded fast enough on state captures. Pretty intimidating. <laughs> but to calm my nerves, I will be, uh, take comfort in the fact that the only thing more terrifying than having 2,000 of you wanting to go for me is having to sit on the stage with Honorable Glynis Breitenbach. <laughs> but, um, so wish me luck. Uh, Flat flattery will get you everywhere. Answer my question. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think we all know, and it's, it's very important to, to make the point, that con what South Africa wants right now is convictions in state capture matters. But that is not everything that accountability is about. We have convicted in the last five years 700 senior government officials for corruption. We have enrolled over 200 cases against some of the most senior public and private sector officials in the country. And the NPA is an organization, as Trevor Manuel spoke about earlier, trying to rebuild itself dealing with 850,000 matters a year. We are moving forward. I know the progress is difficult and slow, 
But in a constitutional democracy, convictions don't come up front in the process. They come at the end of the process, and that's how constitutional democracies work. We have to follow the evidence, we feel the pressure, but we cannot succumb to it. And I just want us not to lose sight of the fact that we must use our anger and our, our, our thirst for the rule of law as South Africans. It's one of the things that holds us in the greatest stead moving forward. But we mustn't lose sight of the fact that progress in these cases all over the world takes time. And if we have time on this panel, we can speak about some international comparisons. But to say that nothing's happening on state capture is simply not factual. All right, but here's the point I want to make. We don't have time. You see, it's different to other countries. We're an unbelievably fragile state of constitutional democracy in South Africa. There are political parties who are actually contesting this election, some of whom I would have thought would have been the subject of the NPA already, but let's leave that aside for the moment. And the simple proposition I'm making to you is, in the light of the fact that we have to get hold of this, control of this, we don't have time. So the question is, when is this going to happen? I mean, I don't care if it's 101. Just one of the people who really ruined this country, if they're, bef if they're before the courts, I want to tell you, everybody here would applaud you. 200 of them are before the courts. No, not where all the schleppers are, not the serious people. <laughs> that, Dennis, that's Sorry, uh, well, simply well, not me, true. Well, it's let's go through the Zondo true. Commission report. Which of the high-profile politicians have been charged. We have, I'm not going to mention names because then those very politicians say, why didn't you mention other people's names, you're biased. The NPA has, has to act independently. There are 200 high profile people before, before court at the moment. South Africa is one of the few constitutional democracies that has its former Secretary General of the ruling party on trial, the former President of the country on trial, and say what you want about how long the case is. <laughs> yes, that's former another. ministers, CEOs, big corporates, and we're also one of the few countries that has taken back over 14 billion rand in stolen funds and put it into the criminal asset recovery. Fund. My point is not that we're not doing enough. We have to do more, we have to do it faster, but it doesn't help South Africa, the rule of law, and the general discussion that we all need to move this country forward on to lose sight of the fact that progress is being made, there are serious challenges ahead, and we can speak about how to overcome those. One is, is bringing the specialist skills and partnerships into the government to rebuild the institution. The other is to recognize that there are lots of hardworking prosecutors in the NPA fighting for their lives, risking their lives every day. And in Cape Town, we're in Cape Town. Four of the most senior drug dealers are on trial in the city right now and behind bars, not because prosecutors are going after schleppers, but because they're risking their lives every single day. So let's not lose sight of that, but let's keep angry about the lack of but progress. But you do accept that when we see some of these cases successfully actually being prosecuted and put in prison. Of you course. do accept at that point, you probably won't get a hard time from me at this particular situation, and not either from the public either. Of, of course I accept that, and I want to again say, South Africans set the rule of law bar high. Our history demands it, our future depends on it, yeah. but let's not forget that at the end of 2022, the head of the investigative directorate was voted person of the year by this very audience. For what reason? because nine of the most seminal state capture matters in the country were enrolled. Then you have one or two slip-ups. One case, and one of them is on appeal. The other one, as you might have read in, your, in News 24 this morning, is facing some complications. You don't mind. Crispin's already mentioned the complexity of the okay. Guptas. One or two slip-ups, and suddenly all is lost. It's a little bit like with our Springbok rugby team. They were completely written off before they win the World Cup. But then three months later, if they lose two games, they get written off again. Let's not write off the NPA. Let's put pressure on Not the writing NPA, them off. But don't write it off. I'm putting them on trial, not writing them off. That's Carry right. on. Yeah. Thank you. So I know in your op-ed, you mentioned, Advocate Diplicy, you mentioned plenty of the big fish are being, I mean, tar not targeted. They are facing prosecution actions. Or He's not. never used the word targeted in the NPA. <laughs> Absolutely. In my field, that is a very bad word. But they are, I just want to point out that what you're saying sounds great, but we all know there are plenty of fish in the sea. And while it sounds great, it doesn't necessarily feel great. But with that, I just want to go to Advocate Breitenbach. I could see some expressions <laughs> happening there. And I just wanted to find out what, <laughs> surely based on your expressions, what you make of the situation with the NPA. And if you could, just police and crime intelligence specifically specifically given your history with our former crime intelligence head turned criminal, how crime intelligence is at the moment because the NPA obviously f flows and ties into what's happening in intelligence. So, good morning everybody. Um, Judge Davis asked uh, Anton a pretty pointed question. He said, how many 
of them are on trial? The answer is simple, none. Um, at the moment, none. Uh, he's correct, there are difficulties, it's not easy. Prosecuting uh, complex commercial matters is definitely not easy and it takes time. I'm not quite sure that it needs to take this amount of time. And I remain unconvinced that, uh, that at least one or two couldn't have been convicted already. Uh, and nothing that you say or you say will convince me of it being different. Um, they should have been convicted already, at least one or two, and the time taken is unacceptable for all of us. Uh, what the people of South Africa want to see are bums in jail, and I use bums in the widest sense of the word, <laughs> and, uh, and, and that's simply not happening, and, and you really do need to pay a bit more attention to that. I understand that you've got millions of other cases to deal with every day. That's your job. That's what two and a half thousand prosecutors get paid to do every day. But this is also your job and you actually need to do it. Because at the moment you're not. And how you should do it differently? Well, you should uh, go out and find prosecutors who can do the job because you don't have any. And you should Three. rehire them. Three. You don't have any well, That's a have, very sweeping statement, if you have, don't mind me saying so. If, if I count the prosecutors that they have who can do those cases at the moment on two hands, I will have fingers over and I'm quite sure that I'm correct. Uh, which isn't enough to deal with the volume of cases that we're expecting them to prosecute. So they've got to bring in skills and you need to go out and do that. And I've undertaken to help you with it and I'm going to help you. And I've already got three online. Um, so, yes, you asked about crime intelligence. Uh, I don't think that, that crime intelligence is, is a, well, A, it's a oxymoron, and B, I don't think it exists at the moment. Uh, it was completely destroyed by, by Richard and Bluely, and I heard... Um, well, it's behind bars, by the way. Well, co coincidentally, and really nothing to brag about, so I'd be careful about that if I were you. Um, <clears throat> I heard Trevor refer to Jiba and Mkwebi. You know, they tried their very best. Uh, to, to prevent Mdluli ever going on trial for anything at all. He used the covert fund as his own personal bank account. Uh, and when we tried to prosecute him for my trouble, I've got both uh, suspended, disciplined, and then prosecuted criminally. Yeah. Well, you know, go figure. In any event, uh, I see you're very proud of the fact that he's serving a sentence for, I think it is assault, assault, kidnapping. He should have been serving a sentence for murder. And, uh, and the fact that he isn't is an indictment on the NPA. The fact that he isn't being charged right now as we speak for all his uh, theft and, and fraud and corruption on the covert fund is also an indictment on the NPA, and it needs to get done. So don't say he's beyond bars. He's in fact out already. As a matter of interest, he's no longer in prison. So that's, uh, that's where we are. It's, it's, a, it's a difficult picture. I understand the, the difficulties of the NPA. It's, it's not easy. Uh, they've got a lot of rebuilding to do, uh, but everybody here is not, not interested in personal problems. They want to see results. Yes, Michael? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a conversation that needs to be realigned here because I think with the greatest of respect to the previous speaker, <coughs> there are a lot of good people in uniform and a lot of good people in the NPA who are trying to do good work. I think their problem is a political one. And I think there's a lack of political will so that good people can do what is necessary. <coughs> are you suggesting that the NPA aren't independent then? Absolutely. Well, the very, absolutely the, they are or they're not? That they're not. The very, the very fact... NPA are not independent? Not enough. The fact that they have to rely on politicians to appoint their senior leadership, the fact that they have to rely on politicians for budget, the fact that Anton's got to sit here and say, I can't name someone because that'll be seen to be targeting. He can't speak freely here because of politics. And I think we need to bring it back to the fact that there's a problem with political will in this country. If the, last, the, the current and the previous president, if we had a functional criminal justice system, it would be against their interests. The unity of the ANC, a functional criminal justice system, is not in the interests of the unity of the ANC. And I want to just bring in the important point of what rose from the Glenister litigation around the collapse of the Scorpions. When they spoke about the need for our law enforcement agencies to comply to this idea of STIRS, so that they are specialized and they have units that are designed to target important priority crimes, that we have highly trained people who know what they're doing and have the ability to deal with complex matters, that they are independent, the point we were just dealing with now. You're quoting the Hoffman 
argument. Absolutely. Well, and resource that, guarantee. That doesn't necessarily make it authority. <laughs> I beg your pardon? That doesn't necessarily make it authority for anything. No, but let's deal with it on the merits. Yeah. If law enforcement agencies were more specialized, better trained, independent, that their budgets were guaranteed as a percentage of the national budget, not dependent on the right, very let politicians... Me, let me stop you there, because, because is there not now effectively that kind of institution which has been recreated, as I understand it? Isn't that what you're doing? No. Well, well sorry, luckily, uh, <laughs> luckily, I didn't ask you, I asked Anton. Sorry, and carry on. Luckily, I'm not a politician, so I don't have to engage. Yeah, just explain this, this to me. What my, I'd like you to interchange with Michael on this, please. So, so the first point about the NBA is independence. The fact that I can't mention suspects is not because I'm not independent at that level. No prosecution senior leader in the world will discuss suspects. Now, let's move on from that point. So, so that independence is separate. The independence of the NPA to make decisions on prosecution is unquestionable, and the current leadership of the, of the NPA is not beholden to any political party or anyone. And please be clear of that, and I think we should, we should appreciate that. Where you are right is on the question of the NPA's what we call operational and financial independence. We are moving towards that. We've just created a new investigative directorate through asking. a bill. And that bill is going to give us back something really important that you need to tackle these complex crimes. And that's a prosecution-led investigation model. In other words, prosecutors will work together with investigators that report to the prosecution head. That is the model that we've seen worked in the past. It's the model that works internationally. And we fought very hard to get this bill through Parliament. It's now been signed off by the National Council of Provinces. We're going to go back to a, a, a situation where we have prosecution-led investigation, and we're going to work with the private sector and with everyone else to bring the skills that Glynis speaks question, about into the NPA. But I certainly want yeah. to disagree and say that there aren't five, six, or seven... But, but can I just stop you and NPA. ask you this? I think what Michael's point is, and I, I, I take the point, Michael, which is that I think the argument which, which he's developing, and certainly was Paul Hoffman that argued, is that it isn't sufficiently independent because it's still anchored above it is effectively political control. And the notion should be that there should be an utterly independent body. Well, let's take it one step further. If you're, Am I, you're is that not correct? Yes, it is. But let's take it one step further. The reason we cannot talk about any high profile cases against state capture implicated people is exactly that problem. We're talking about people who you've described as the, the, the small fry, and the high-profile people are not being yes, touched. I'm, I'm trying to keep to the point, sorry, before I get my colleague in, just trying to keep to this point, is, is your argument not that this idea of an independent investigative body, which basically recreates the Scorpions, which finally is a partial acknowledgement of a disastrous uh, decision was taken to abandon them in the first place, but the argument as I understand it is that it still has over it a, a political control which doesn't make it entirely independent. I thought that's your argument. It is the argument. I refer to the fact that we don't have high-profile convictions from state capture as evidence of that particular argument, no. but it doesn't just relate to this particular body. But you it, would accept that there's progress here? Well, I mean, progress against what standard? Well, there's a progress, and at least they've partly reconstituted mm. the Scorpions. The, they've partly reconstituted? Well, they've reconstituted. I mean, you've got to admit, when you talk about crawling over the bar, I mean, that, that bar is very, very low if we're going to call that progress. I'm sorry, with respect, the Scorpions did a pretty good job. Yes, they and did. And people like you or your predecessors said that's where we should go. So Without when they put question. it back, then you moan again. I'm referring to the fact that all those years later, the progress that you are asking us to applaud is that we partly okay. reconstituted the scorpions. So, thank you. Sorry to interrupt that very no, no. heated <laughs> debate. No. I'm a journalist, I'm used to it, it's fine. But I actually just want to rewind a little and just remind us that we actually all kind of lucky to be in this very safe room, or what we think is a very safe room at the moment. We are sitting in a province, and I go back to this because this is really important. We are sitting in a province where there are shootings, I can safely say daily, okay? A lot of this is great to debate and hear. I want to kind of turn this around a little and point out something that I think you touched on earlier, Advocate. You mentioned that there are big cases in the Western Cape. There are big gang cases happening in the Western Cape. What I'd like to put to Crispin, because I know you also are familiar with various cases that are playing out here and everywhere else in the country, but what I would like to put to you is how do you reconcile what's happening on the ground, which is a very different, very gritty reality, by being able to, against what is happening in courts, etc. So what I'm basically asking is, We've got this on the ground, which is a very different reality to what we're discussing now, basically, although this is a nicely veneered way of discussing it. But how do you speak about this 
while taking into consideration realities which we don't necessarily get to talk about an air year because this isn't that forum. Yeah, I think and that's, that's really where we should also discuss the functionality of the criminal justice system on the whole. Um, we often look at it, particularly from a political lens, which politicians are being charged, which, who is in prison, who is not. But ultimately, it should come down to how functional is the system? How many cases are going through the system? And are those cases being finalized in a time that we can really say is a reasonable time? You know, one of the, the flaws that I think we have as South Africans is, rightly so, we should be looking at the higher echelons and holding them to account. The rule of law should have no equal. But we should also be able to understand that corruption and crime is not an exclusively political problem. It's a societal problem. What do I mean by this? This morning I just read something from the SIU where they have found 400 million rand of NASFAS money at an institution of higher learning that was not returned to NASFAS. This is an institution of higher learning, a reputable one in Pretoria, I can say, the University of Pretoria. <laughs> Why is an institution of higher learning sitting with state money and not allocating it when people are are actually not able to get funding for education. So we really need to look at our problems societally and systemically to say, well, it's not the fact that Glynis's friend is behind bars that makes the system work. It's the fact that we know for sure that the rule of law will catch you. <laughs> and, and you know, actually in this country, we can actually say that. This is the only country, I think, in the world that had a former president behind bars, a former police commissioner behind bars, um, Glynis's friend, Richard well, Glynis, behind is bars, and I can count good. many others. So <laughs> the rule good. of law does catch up with you in this country. It's a question of how we get there. And to Michael's point around independence, the logical conclusion of his point is that ID should be a constitutional chapter 9 institution. Well, we've seen that we have characters in this country who can go as far as getting to a chapter 9 institution. I only have to point to another friend of Glynis's in Parliament, okay. the public Glynis protector. has so many friends. So clearly, <laughs> clearly, clearly, when people want to capture the state, they, they really don't stop. Even chapter 9 institutions are not limits. So we must really be able to commend the fact that we have the constitution that we have, and it's been able to repel to some great extent state capture. But yes, some institutions, as Trevor highlighted, have been hollowed out. And that is what Anton is dealing with, rebuilding the institutions so that they're able to prosecute everyday crimes and not just okay. being judged by the high-profile crimes that we see. Can I just ask you this? Uh, Anton mentioned um, the News24 report uh, in relation to a particularly important case, which really has very serious allegations against what we call the presiding officer, if I could put it that way. Uh, it's in the public domain now, I'm not suggesting, which is a serious problem. Secondly, a judge in this division, on two separate occasions in judgments, has suggested that the gangs of the Western Cape are in cahoots with senior police officers. Right? Not once, twice he has mentioned this. Now, I, I, I can't tell you, you know, I, I wasn't sitting in the case, so I don't know what the evidence was, but you have to take that incredibly seriously. Now, you can't have a criminal justice system if the NPA are going to prosecute people and <laughs> the presiding officer isn't quite as kosher as they should be. Mm -hmm. And you can't ha basically deal with the gangs of this town, which, by the way, is the most fundamental problem, it seems to me, for people living here in other parts of the country, if you've got the police in cahoots with the gangs. How is that going to be dealt with? And then that's a serious, serious problem that we are confronted with. Well, I know that. That's why I'm asking. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact of the matter is that these, these matters are on the table and are being investigated. And what we want to see is them reaching their logical conclusion, like what we've just discovered now with the, the News24 article. A presiding officer, your, your ill. It's extra yeah, it's a, yeah, well, don't blame me for that, but it's true. <laughs> but I it mean, it's a really worrying thing because the NPA got into trouble about that case. But it shows you how... I mean, pervasive corruption is. So it's not an exclusive political problem. If your ilk you are part of the problem, then we really have a problem as society. Okay, uh, sorry, uh, Anton, I know, can you, you can make your point briefly because there's a question here. 
Thank you. And also, I just want to point out that the point of the matter is that while we are sitting here, there are people that are scared to leave their houses because of shootings, because of that pervasive corruption. And that isn't our fault, and that's why we have people on this panel who should be or are addressing it. They can argue should or are. Anyway, we've got a question from Ruan Volyun. So I'm not sure who to address it. I think Advocate Breitenbach, I've made eye contact with you. But uh, while South Africa... Would South Africa not benefit from decentralization of the police? Because like many service mm. delivery issues in our country, communities have little recourse to hold their local police accountable. It ties in with what we've just discussed. Sure. So first of all, I'd like to say that both Anton and Crispin have a wonderful career ahead of them in politics. They're excellent at deflection. Um, <laughs> to answer your question... Yes, uh, that's what we want. Uh, it would, it, there's something that we, as the Democratic Alliance, have been fighting very hard for, for a long time. The devolution of powers to the lowest competent level. Uh, it's something that the government, policing is a national functionality, and something that the Minister of Police uh, hates more than, uh, you know, cockroaches. He, he, he will not even listen to an argument about the devolution of power. Uh, it will solve problems if you can devolve policing powers to the lowest competent authority. It will bring policing to the places where it's needed most. You will be able to concentrate uh, police presence and ability and functionality and resources to those places where it's needed the most. And we've shown in the Western Cape that it works. Good. In the Western Cape, we have uh, created our own uh, metro police force that are visible, their boots on the ground, it has made an enormous difference, and our crime stats are going in the right direction, they're going down. Not a lot, tiny, but it's progress, and it's, it's proof of the fact that the person who asked that question is correct. The devolution of policing powers will enormously assist to controlling crime in, yes. in hotspot areas. Yes, please. Glennis, likely not all prosecutors become politicians, so it's certainly not something I'm striving to become. But um, I, I think... You would have fooled me. What, <laughs> what, what is important to recognize here, and again, colleagues, it's not to shirk responsibility. We have a crime crisis in this country, and a lot needs to be done. The point is, let's not create red herrings out of the challenges. I think Trevor Manuel spelt it out. It's, we are 30 years into our democracy. We're a toddler as far as constitutional democracies go, let's not use the current crisis as a way to throw the baby out with the bathwater. There has been progress over the last 30 years. Our system does need reform, not only from the policing and crime intelligence, but as we heard from, from Judge Davis now, all the way through to the judiciary. Let's use this moment. Let's use this crisis not to play politics. Let's put the politics aside and recognize that our future of this country depends on us fixing the system that was created in a euphoric moment after 1994 with certain design flaws. There are design flaws in our criminal justice system, but the good news, as um, Trevor Manuel pointed out, we know what they are. We've known what they are since 2007. Now is the time to get, find the leadership at national, provincial, and local levels to fix it. We don't have time on this panel because we've got eight minutes left, but we actually know how to fix this broken criminal justice system. What we need is not what I can give. What we need is political leadership and we need the country to come together, and we need society, all of you, to make the rule of law politically indispensable. So as we move forward, for any politician, they must know they will not get your votes unless the rule of law is at the forefront of their priorities. And to do that, we have to forget about politicians and focus on building institutions at all levels. We need to partner with the private sector, the civil society, and then very importantly, we can't just be pointing fingers because corruption doesn't just happen in state institutions. Corruption is planned in the boardrooms of some of the biggest corporates in this country. So the corporate sector also has to come to the party, focus on their own accountability, and collectively, let's get back to that point, the rule of law is politically indispensable for the future of this country. We know how to fix it, we just have to do it. If I may judge, if I may direct a question at... Michael, yeah. I just want to check you. Uh, he is a prolific tweeter. I explained I did stalk everyone on this panel mildly online. And I noted a tweet of yours earlier this week. It said that you are, you, well, not you actually say would be keen to build more correctional services. Um, facilities, which is more prisons, which to me seems like, okay, but you're kind of encouraging crime then because you're saying, oh yes, people commit crime, we'll make space for you. What do you say in 
response to your own tweet? How would you actually go about pushing for societal change as opposed to creating more correctional services facilities, which are basically prisons, what prisons, are birthplaces of the worst? Sorry, I quote a gangster who told me that in 2013. <laughs> so I think we've got to understand the problem with which we're dealing with is twofold. There is the societal problems to which you refer, and it is not a coincidence that in countries where you have the highest levels of socioeconomic inequality, you have the highest levels of crime. You also have the highest levels of contact crime and sexual offences, because these are the problems that come out of very unequal societies. There's no question from an Action SA standpoint that you need policies that are going to target those particular problems. But we also need to appreciate that the solving of those problems are long term. And law-abiding South Africans should not have to live with a lawless society while those long-term changes are taking effect. That is why we put forward a policy that we believe is the toughest policy on crime. And I believe with, with Anton here, he was correct. We need to get the politics right so that the law enforcement can do its job. From our perspective, we believe there needs to be a conversation about victims' rights. So much of our criminal justice system is orientated around the rights of criminals. And in real terms, People are being killed, people are being raped by people who should never have been out of jail in the first place because the prisons are overcrowded and they get released early because our criminal justice system lets them out. And from our point of view, we hold the belief that we do need more prisons because in an Action SA government, if you commit violent crime or if you're a repeat offender, we want life to mean life. We throw away the key and you can never come out to hurt another South African again. Is the point not that we need more prisons, but we put a lot of people in prison who shouldn't be there. Absolutely. Yes. You see, I'm speaking now of a quarter of a century as a drug. You go, on a Friday morning, when we do reviews of the magistrate's court, do you know how many cases I get where somebody steals three avocado pears from ShopRite checkers that pick and pay and gets six months in prison from a magistrate? They shouldn't be in prison. So it's not a question of more pr uh, uh, prisoners. Don't you think it's a question that the entire sentencing practice has to be re rehauled, in, overhauled, so that we actually get the right people in prison? Well, I actually think it's both. Because I think we I'm need to differentiate this, I, between violent worried, offenders. Sorry, I'm very worried about this, that you put them all in prison. No. I don't I know, we, were you ever, have you ever gone and visited a prison? No, I haven't. Oh, I'll well, take maybe you with we should take time. you there. Because I but want to tell you something. Worst, uh, it is the most shocking. It's the mo As a judge, I went. I was shocked the first time I went. Truly, what I'm trying to say to you is, I, I, I really mean this. We should get the right people in prison, and those, for example, who shouldn't be in prison, because you know what prisons do. They make greater criminals out of those put in prison yeah. in the first place. Sure. Um, but sorry, can, so I, can sorry, I respond right, to that? So sorry. Because um, we've got the, the, the questions point, the from the audience. Sorry. Oh my gosh, I'll talk to politician. Whoop, whoop. Sorry. <laughs> but Crispin, <laughs> sorry. Uh, we do have questions from the audience, and I really, we've got four, oh, five, four minutes. Yeah, Crispin, to, to you, what prevents SA from bringing back the scorpions? That's a question from Brian May. Brian, the, the ID bill has just been passed by the NCOP. The ID That's is effectively a rebooted scorpion That's type right. of tool. <laughs> and we're waiting for the president to assent to the bill. And we will have a prosecution-led uh, agency that will ensure that we deal I with high-level crime in the way that the scorpion dealt with it. So we are there already. This might shake her uh, head, but... I'm sorry, I, I can't let that go by. That's just not true. What's the, not true? The, the fact that the ID is the rebooted scorpions, it's not true. Why? The ID is a, is, an, is a unit now within the NPA that's been made permanent uh, that will Pros have prosecution... Don't interrupt me. Prosecution-led investigations. That's good. Of course it's good. It's a little bit of progress, but it's not the solution to the problem. What? We saw what happened to the Scorpions. It can be dissolved by a, a simple majority in Parliament. So, 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 so as soon as they piss the politicians off, they'll vote them out in again. 30, in 30 seconds, what is the solution? The solution is quite clear. Uh, we must set up an anti-corruption commission, a chapter 9 institution that's outside of the National Prosecuting Authority but works in conjunction with them so that there's, no, no, there's, there's enough power to go around here. There are many reasons and why no... Don't interrupt me either. That. And many reasons. Don't interrupt me. <laughs> next time I won't be so nice. <laughs> okay. And have an independent, freestanding chapter 9 institution that is strict on appointments of the head and not political appointments with, uh, with the capacity to investigate, prosecute, 
and have forensic capabilities with proper resourcing and proper funding that doesn't depend on Parliament for its funding. That's what we That's need. That's a powerful point. Are, are we running out of time? And there's a question which comes from the audience, which I wanted, I wanted to ask you in any event. One of the great strategies world over is the so-called Al Capone strategy, that you get these gang people, you get these politicians through tax. How much cooperation is there between SARS and the NPA to actually have that strategy employed to put people behind bars for tax evasion? There, there's, we, we have a specialized tax unit that works with SARS all the time. The Al Capone approach is the right approach. We have to prioritize. Uh, we have to make sure the right people are going to jail for these offenses. Cooperation can always be improved. Um, it's certainly something that's happening across the, the, the system at the moment. Um, but we are, are working very closely with SARS all the time. But are there, I mean, I don't want you to name cases, obviously, but are we using that against, for example, gang bosses, against politicians of a high priority? I mean, is there, or can you assure the audience that this is a strategy which is a priority? Because clearly it's the one that works worldwide. It's certainly part of our big case strategy, and it does come to the point Linus was making uh, on the prosecution led model. I do finally. not agree that you need a Chapter 9 entity. There's no country in the world that has something like that for very good reason. The reasons we, c we don't have time to go into, but the reasons, the, the three main reasons, is firstly, politically, that's not going to happen. You need a constitutional amendment for it. So let's not make perfect the enemy of a good at the time when we're really trying to make incremental progress. Secondly, the, the resources that everyone thinks can be thrown into a new entity don't exist. So rather invest them in the ones that do exist with 30 years of experience. And thirdly, the expertise that everyone that Linus assumes will flock to this new entity also doesn't exist. And the only place you'll take them from is within the current system. So let's not throw the baby out with a bottle. Please don't interrupt. You've got nothing. <laughs> um, uh, You've got nothing. I'm and, uh, <laughs> And, and so it, it's most certainly not the panacea to the problem, although it, politically it does sound fantastic. Well, I'm afraid we're out of time, and unlike a previous speaker, I'd like to keep to time. Um, and, and so uh, what I wanted to say on our behalf, I mean, these are obviously issues that you can't deal with in 35 minutes entirely, but at least we've given some, I hope, indication of where we should go. Sorry for that we couldn't accommodate everything, but thank you to everybody. And uh, this is perhaps the most Thank crucial you. of all issues. Thank you. Thank you.